Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I think we're still waiting for a couple more people to trickle in on U of T time, but I'll get us started because I'm really excited to get into the content today. Uh, my name is Liliana from the School of Cities, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to our virtual session uh, with Lynette Ong, our Knowledge Cafe. The School of Cities was founded in 2018 to be the University of Toronto's multidisciplinary center for urban research, education, and engagement. And we are dedicated to uncovering new ways for cities and their residents to thrive. Uh, so the Knowledge Cafe is part of this mission, and I'm so excited for everybody to learn about today's incredible topic. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge first that for thousands of years, the land upon which we in Toronto convene today has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, or what we settlers call North America, and we are so grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on this land. I hope that our conversation today generates uh, insights and some thoughtful reflection on how we can better steward this land in the spirit of the dish with one spoon wampum belt agreement, an agreement on how the land can be shared to the mutual benefit of all of its inhabitants. Since we're meeting today virtually, I know that maybe not everybody is in Toronto. So if you're not, I really encourage you to look into who the indigenous occupants of the land you're on are, how you can support them and how you can steward your land. So with that, uh, welcome to the Knowledge Cafe. This is a monthly speaking opportunity for the tri-campus community at U of T to present analysis and highlights of their research on a theme that is important and relevant to cities. It provides a platform for faculty and student researchers who are working to uncover solutions to creating more just, equitable, sustainable, and prosperous cities. This year, our Knowledge Cafe theme is belonging, migration, and thriving. And we have lined up nine amazing expert speakers from departments across the tri-campus community, from art history to industrial engineering to sociology and planning to today's topic. So uh, you can check out our website to learn more about our speakers, and you can also see the chat for more information about upcoming events. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Lynette, who is an amazing speaker. She has an incredible topic for us today, and I'm so excited for us to all learn about it. Thank you so much. Um... So my, my name is Lynette Ong, um, a professor of political science at the University of Toronto. And thank you so much to the School of Cities for, in, for inviting me to share my research. So this research is based on uh, a book project that I've recently um, completed. And the book was published by Oxford University Press uh, a couple of months ago in May, early this year. The book is called uh, Outsourcing Repression, Everyday State Power in Contemporary China. Um, but I can promise you that it has everything to do with cities and everything to do with urbanization, as you will find out in a minute. So I'll start off with a quote from reading Lolita in Tehran. The worst crime committed by totalitarian mindsets is that they force their citizens, including their victims, to become complicit in their crimes. So dancing with your jailer, participating in your execution, that is an act of utmost brutality. So the puzzle, the theoretical puzzle that the book addresses is, so we know that state repression, if you, if you try to repress somebody or even an object, it will usually bounce back. You will, invite, you will be inviting resistance or backlash. So the task for the state that is trying to, rep to repress citizens, to get them to comply to citizen to state policies, will be on the one hand, how do you actually balance coerce compliance with minimizing backlash and resistance? The empirical context of this book project is that China has, has achieved enormous urbanization in the last two decades from, from, uh, 40, from 40 percent of urbanization rate in 1990s to 50 percent in 2011 and to 62 percent as in, as in this year. And uh, given this high rapid rate of, ur of urbanization, the very intrinsic characteristics of urbanization in China is, is one of a state-led process. So as compared to a lot of organic ur uh, urbanization that we have seen in many developing countries across the world, uh, the process in China is very much a state-led and state 
engineered and orchestrated process in terms of how they would zone certain land and classify people uh, into urban citizens in order to turn them into consumers. So about 10 years ago, uh, Premier Li Keqiang, the Premier who is on his way out, uh, articulated this vision that, you know, ur that urbanization will become the engine of growth in China's economy. And that is really the thinking behind it. So you could imagine in the process of rapid urbanization, a lot of people have been displaced. So millions of peasants have been have been displaced as a result. And a lot of urban residents have been moved, moved around from central business district to the outskirts of the cities in order to make space for more lucrative commercial opportunities in, uh, in certain areas. It has also provoked resistance, but these resistance are really pockets of resistance. There has been no land movement, no housing movement in China, despite massive displacement. So the empirical question is, how has the Chinese state been able to engineer such a massive urbanization within a short time frame with minimum resistance. And the solution that the book proposes is one of outsourcing repression, that the state outsources repression to two major types of known state actors, that is known state violent, uh, uh, violent thugs and nonviolent brokers. So these brokers are embedded within society and, and embedded within the community that they are able to draw on social capital and human relationship to convince uh, those reluctant citizenry to sign consent papers. And these violent thugs, they usually use uh, intimidation or very low level type of violence in order to get people to comply with, uh, with, with state policies. So throughout the book, the, the context is is one of land grabs in rural areas or urban demolition uh, with bulldozers and uh, two, ma two major type of uh, non-state actors. However, the thing to note here is these non-state actors, they are faceless individuals, right? They are, they, are, they are faceless individuals as portrayed in the book cover. Uh, so uh, these are anonymous individuals that that their names will never be revealed or identified in Chinese media because they are too trivial. They are just everyday person in, uh, in Chinese society. So two major types of non-state actors, thugs for hire and brokers who exercise everyday repression and mobilizing the masses, two strategies respectively, that in turn helps to augment everyday state power. So the book challenges, you know, three major bodies of uh, of of literature, uh, state repression. So traditionally, we think we think about state repression as the military, as the paramilitary uh, or police ar arrest. After protests break out, you know, the government will send in the military to uh, put down the protesters, such as in Tiananmen in 1989, or to send in the police to arrest people, right? But if we imagined state repression, if we redefine state rep uh, repression to allow the state really to grab and to mobilize a certain number of non-state actors in order to mobilize the rest of society. So if we take that argument to its logical conclusion, state power will have to be reconfigured. So it is also an invitation for the readers to reimagine the contours of state power once the state is able to outsource repression to the society. It also introduces a new tool of authoritarian control. So if we think about, you know, this autocrats has many tools in his toolkit, we typically have carrots and sticks. But this book also introduces that of persuasion, that is the state mobilizing of of non-state individuals to talk to people, to convince uh, reluctant citizenry to comply with state citizens, drawing on social capital, right? So this becomes uh, a dynamics between society, one societal members to, a, to another societal members. Okay, um, so the, the book draws on three empirical strategies. Number one, ethnographic research that I have conducted annually from 2011 to 2019. 
so nearly a decade of uh, of uh, of work and my team then built a uh, event data set of land grab and housing demolition from 90s to the late uh, 2010. We have more than 2000 ob observation. And number three, uh, we then scrape uh, some policy documents from government uh, websites. Uh, so these policy documents are issued by the central government. They are issued by Shanghai, Chengdu and Zhengzhou municipalities, which are three major cities that I have spent a lot of time in. And we analyze these uh, policy documents really to get a sense of what these governments have have in mind. So these governments will articulate how housing demolition should be con should be conducted, how land expropriation should be conducted. So if you like, strategy number three is an input data. It articulates government intention of how policies should be done. But strategies one and two are output data. Given this intention, what are the actual outcome? How are they actually uh, implemented on the ground and how are they then received by the citizens. So this map gives you an, an idea of where I've traveled to and where I've been in, in uh, throughout uh, from 2011 to 2019. So I started off in Hefei, which is, you know, uh, a province uh, next to a coastal uh, city in 2011. Then I moved westward to Beige, uh, to Kunming, which is southwestern city that borders uh, Southeast Asia. Cheng, uh, Chengdu, which I've spent a lot of time in, uh, because it is a wonderful city, one of the most you know, pleasant cities in China, in my opinion. But it is also a really interesting city to observe how ur how urbanization has really transformed the landscape of the city. Uh, a lot of interesting observations. And I also spent time in Zhengzhou. Uh, then later part of my research, uh, I moved on to more coastal areas like Shanghai, Guangzhou, and Tianjin. So you see two types of indicators on the map. Uh, the squares are those cities that I've spent time in, and then I've, ge I've gathered enough data to put together case studies in the book. The round the circles are cities that I have visited, but for one reason or another, I did not gather enough data for me to put together a case studies, but I have got quotations uh, spring, sprinkled throughout different sections of the book. So in schematic terms, this is how everyday state power is being practiced or exercised. So outsourcing repression is really a two-step process. Step one, the state will marshal a small group of society to become proxies, right? So these are thugs for hire and uh, grassroots bro brokers. And these proxies then in turn repress or mobilize the masses. That is the second step. Now, the, uh, 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 an important scope condition is, complex, is complicity of these proxies. So these proxies, they go out there and do the state bidding. They do dirty jobs for the state. This gives, in turn gives rise to three dimensions of state power. Number one, participation of a small group of, of society, which, uh, who are the proxies. Num, uh, number two, acquiescence of the larger society. And number three, in selective occasion, on, on, on selected occasions, um, when these grassroots brokers draw on their social capital, they could in turn uh, legitimize state power or allows the state to uh, maintain its state legitimacy. So who are these thugs for hire? They are the ruffians, hooligans, hoodlums, street gangsters, or sometimes even legalized professionals who render violence as a for-profit service. So the way to think about them, they are, they are just an average person on the Chinese street. So the Chinese will call any Zhang San Li Si, right? who are usually unemployed people who are willing to make trouble for a living. So they go out there and mobilize a group of them who are willing to sell their muscle power for money. Uh, and they are mobilized and then uh, organized as a group to do a project for the government, to intimidate people in the middle of the night, to get them to consent to state, to state policies, right? But they are also quite distinct from, let's say, you know, 
uh, Russian mafias in Putin's case, or the Japanese Yakuza, or even the Russian uh, violent entrepreneurs in the 90s. They are distinct because these thugs were hired. They are untrained individuals. They do not belong to any permanent organization, any permanent m mafia groups. They do not comply with certain code of conduct. So these are loose individuals in Chinese society who are mobilized to do a certain project and they are dismissed or they become dispensable to the state once the project is conducted. So if we were to compare these facts for hire with other types of uh, known state, with, with other types of violent actors in the literature, uh, compared to the military, the, the paramilitary and the police, these are the people who are uniformed violent actors who exercise legitimate uh, uh, violence because they are appointed by the government, they exercise public force. Whereas the facts for hire, they are like the mafias who, who exercise private force. However, the thugs were hired, they have very low capacity for violence because they don't wear any arm, they don't bear any arm, they don't, you know, carry any weapons, not, not usually anyway. Uh, so their capacity for violence compared to other types of violent actors are much lower. But there are actually benefits for mobilizing these untrained uh, uh, individuals because the act that they are contracted to do are often illegal and if not illegal they are e they are illegitimate right and because they do not wear any uniform their non-state identity then 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 offers this pretense of plausible deniability i say plausible because the the benefit of deniability is subject to certain conditions when conditions are met then then uh, this benefit is then offered to the authority that actually hires them. So they are usually hired to meet local government's unfunded mandates. So China is, act is actually a very decentralized state in fiscal terms. So local governments at the bottom, they are tasked to do, they are tasked to provide a, a range of public goods and services, but they are often not given enough revenue to do so. But they are uh, but they are actually evaluated based on the, the task, how well they, they perform in those tasks. So in a range of circumstances, when they don't have the revenue, when they don't have the legitimacy to do, to carry out those ta tasks, they will go for the, the, com the convenient uh, option or solution. That is to hire people to outsource those dirty jobs to uh, violent uh, gangsters who could you know, work for them for a day, for a hundred yuan a, a, a day, um, which is a very you know, um, um, expedient uh, option. But there are also costs in, in, involved, right? So if you Im, if you imagine you hire someone to to clean your house, you must have control over that person's behavior. You must be able to pay the person well enough. That person must be from a from a from, from a an, an agency that actually trained people how to you know become good housekeepers. Um, and the, so in this context, the violence that that they use must be rather disciplined. It it must not be excessive. And you can imagine a range of situation where this condition might not be met. That is when we call when there's an agency problem, when the agent use excessive violence, right? For one reason or another, and they end up committing, uh, 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 they they end up committing an an act that results in casualties. If people get severely hurt, as especially the elderly, uh, in Chinese society, uh, if they cause death you could imagine that it could provoke a lot of sim sympathy. It might attract the attention of social media and this case get exposed on social media. That would in turn come back to bite the government. You will actually get the government into trouble. That is when we see accountability uh, being, being pressed on local leaders. And on some occasions where, where you can imagine some small village authority, when they don't have legitimacy to do a lot of, uh, to provide public goods and services, and they need to rely on these thugs for hire local gangsters on a, on a repeated basis, on a, on a regular and everyday basis. These gangsters then will accumulate more and more power and more legitimacy, and then they actually become second government, right? So they might come back and usurp uh, state authority. 
Now, these might seem like they are all my imagination in my head, but I can promise you that you know at the end of the presentation, I can tell you how all these things have actually uh, uh, come true in China, how it it has actually uh, played out in China over the last decade to the extent that when President Xi Jinping came to power, he actually launched a major campaign to stop these from progressing further. So the other type of non-state actors that the book addresses is one of known of uh, grassroots brokers. So if you see in, in the pictures here, uh, in, in usual cases, these brokers are the, el the elderly. They are retired individuals who might have you know, worked in state-owned enterprises. Uh, so these are people who have lived in the community for decades. They know their neighbors well. They know their relatives who lived in the neighborhood, right? So they have a lot of social cap capital within the, com the community. And the state, if the state wants to convince individuals, if the state were to do it individually, it will incur very high cost. So the state really need brokers to connect with the masses. So the, the book talks about three major types of brokers, the political bro uh, brokers, such as people in urban communities, in neighborhood communities, their power comes from the state, right? And number two, the social brokers. Uh, these are the volunteers. These are the community en enthusiasts. These are the aunties and the uncles in the, in the community, right? Their, their power comes from social capital that they command. And the focus of the second part of the book is really on these social bro brokers, which in my opinion are understudied and under-examined in the literature. And the third type, uh, economic brokers. So the name would suggest that they are people who go out there just to make a profit. To make a profit um, because there's, there's a lot of information asymmetry between the state and society. That is between the demolition office the office that wants to demolish this neighborhood and from the citizenry who actually want to bargain for more compensation. These people want to bargain with the state for more compensation. They, they, they intend to bribe certain, uh, certain individuals, but they don't know how much bribe to offer. And if they offer a bribe to the wrong person, they might in turn get into trouble. But if you have a broker that is trusted by both parties, can bring both parties together, you can imagine that they can talk to demolition officer and they can also talk to people, uh, citizens who want to bargain for more. So the way to think about how they work is they are like ticket scalpers. Right. I know that these days a lot of ticket scalping has actually gone online. But imagine a decade ago, you want to go to Messy Hall, you arrive an hour earlier, you have these people walking around with extra tickets. How do these people get extra tickets? Because they have got backdoor channel into the box office. Right. It's a it's essentially a corrupt deal. They have got backdoor channel with the box with the box office people and they can sell you tickets at higher price. So in this context, these brokers, they help to get extra compensation, let's say an, an extra apartment and X amount of money. And that is split 50% between the client, that is the citizens and the, bro the brokers. The brokers then, then, then will have to share what he has obtained with people in the demolition office. So it's a case of bribery, but, but, but it's arranged in a way that each and every party will actually take a cut. So no one has an incentive to become a whistleblower. Um, okay, on to brokerage. Um, so if we see, you know, a country as divided into state and society, if we, if we were to pull these two layers aside, you can actually squeeze out this middle layer of brokerage. And this is by no means, you know, exclusive to China. There's a lot of comparative literature that talks about this space where state bargains with society. But who occupies this space? It's the brokers that occupies this space. And in and in this book, I I I, I take out this middle layer and put them under the microscope and examine the dynamics uh, they and the important role that they play to bring state and society together. But in the case of China, the thing to note is that the arrow goes directly from the state to the brokers and to society. It's a one-way arrow, 
right? It goes from the top to the bottom. But in other developing countries where brokers have more power, citizens have more power, you could imagine that being a two-way street. But China is very much a top-down type of relationship. So the way to think about uh, brokers, the role they play in China is one of octopus and its tentacles. The brokers are the powerful tentacles of the state that allows the state to deeply penetrate society and really grip society, right? Without which the state will then have to go out on its own to mobilize society, which is, which is you know, a very costly uh, uh, pursuit. So this comes from my data set. Uh, it shows you the frequency of different agents when they are deployed to, to grab land and to demolish houses. Thugs for hire, uh, they are actually the third most frequently deployed agents, just slightly lower than government officials and the police, and much higher than uh, other type of uh, grassroots individuals. So bearing that in, in mind, and this shows the marginal effects of agent types when different agents are present. Uh, the likelihood of provoking nonviolent citizen responses. So the nonviolent responses are protest, petition, and legal mobilization. So the first bar you probably cannot see very well, but the first bar shows shows you the marginal if, effects of thugs for hire when they were de uh, deployed. The likelihood of provoking a bunch of different type of resistance are usually ne uh, negative or marginally positive compared to other type of agents. Same thing here, it shows you the marginal effects of agent types on violent citizen responses, which are harming the agent, self-harm, you might want to kill yourself and self-immolation has happened uh, uh, um, uh, uh, a number of times uh, in throughout the last two decades in China, damage property. Now, as you could see, also the first bar when when thugs were deployed, they their likelihood was either zero, negative, or marginally positive compared to say when when the police uh, were actually deployed to do the same job. So, if you like those uh, regression analysis. Uh, quantitative data shows you the results of everyday cases. On average, this is what happened. But I was also very curious when, you know, we do see protests being uh, broken out in, in some cities. So I then did a bunch of case, case studies and the way that I have selected my cases actually invites purposely inviting uh, selection bias because I looked at Chinese papers I see, you know, there's a big protest that just broke just broke out six months ago in the city, and that is used that is due to violent uh, housing demolition. And then I went to the city to interview people to do some investigation to understand the mechanism why this case has actually failed. So my case selection, uh, my 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 cases are actually all failed failed cases. Failed cases in the sense that excessive violence was being used, which then denies the benefit of possible uh, deniability for, for, for the authority. And in some cases, it also usurps state authority. Um, and uh, some local leaders then ended up being, being punished. Now, let me talk about very briefly, talk about three cases. So this case happens in Shanghai in the former French concession area in 2005. If you know anything about this part of Shanghai at all, this is one of the most expensive uh, real, real estate in the world. Um, in that case, in 2005, they set fire to this neighborhood because they wanted to take land. There were people who refused to, to, to vacate their properties. Um, everyone managed to run away from the fire except this elderly couple in their 80s who were killed in the arson. So until today, so I visited that part of Shanghai in 2018. Until today, this case hasn't been resolved yet. This is a case in Kunming where they also used excessive violence, which resulted in a, in a riot. Um, and that also happened to other villages, not this village in Kunming. So at the end, uh, the governor of Kunming was then uh, removed from, off from office and then put on trial for, for 
for corruption, which is, you know, just a just a charge that to punish that local uh, leader. So you could see a number of elderly women sitting in front of the bulldozer as a symbolic act of uh, resistance. And this case happened in Zhengzhou uh, in the mid 2000s, and I was there in 2015. So I went to about eight villages, but massive and, and violent demolition happened to two dozens of villages. So much so that the, the local leader in charge of demolition in the city at the time has been nicknamed uh, uh, Izume, meaning that when he points his finger on the village on the map, next week the village will disappear. Next week the village will be demolished. That happens on a massive scale within a couple of years. And this picture shows a banner war between between the government and the citizens. So the government would put up the red banner saying that you know demolition and urban reconstruction is good for you, is good for you know our our uh, um, community. And the next day, the citizens will put up this white banner and say, "No, you are cheating us. We don't we don't believe you." Um, and this shows you, you know, three different types of brokers, how they exercise power. So political brokers is one of top-down approach because they are appointed by the state to mobilize society. Whereas social brokers uh, is, a, is a dotted line because they don't have authority to do certain things, but they draw on their own social capital and their own incentives to mobilize community members whom they know very well. And economic brokers has a two-way arrow uh, because it's one of bargaining relationship. They bring state and society together to achieve a better outcome for both parties. And, and this is from my, da my data set that shows you when different types of non-violent uh, non strategies were deployed. Uh, what happened to the rate of compliance and resistance. So if you like, financial re rewards are like carrots when the government offers to give citizens money. Collective punishment and welfare suspension, they are like sticks when the government decides to punish them. If you refuse to comply with my policy, I, I, I will punish you. And thought work are persuasion mobilizing the masses when you send a broker in to persuade people to sign you know it, the conversation usually goes like this uh please sign papers so so the disagreement might be within the fam uh, family and you need the consent of each and every individual adult individual in the family to to allow demolition to happen um, uh, the mother might agree the father might have passed away, uh, the daughter disagree, the son agrees, and so they have to convince the daughters to sign papers. The, do the, the daughter might think, you know, if I sign papers, I don't get much out of it. The son would think, you know, if you sign papers, then I can, I can, I can move to a bigger apartment, uh, I, can, I can enjoy bigger space, so you are just being selfish, right? So these brokers have to go in there and solve intra-family com conflicts. So these have to be individuals who know the families very, very well. Um, and only socially embedded brokers to do that could do that sort of job. So when thought work is being deployed, the rate of compliance is actually very high, close to 80%, even higher than financial rewards. So I then I went through three different case studies to illustrate how brokers conduct harmonious demolition. Harmonious uh, is a Chinese official terminology. It is harmonious because compared to the previous decade, when demolition, when land expropriation usually involves violence, it is, harm it is more harmonious now because they get things done without involving violence. But harmony could be interpreted in different ways. If you, if you send the brokers in, sometimes you cause you know, a lot of family disputes. Uh, you might be able to avoid violence, but the family might not end up talking to each other. You can imagine that that actually put a lot of strain on uh, a societal relationship. 
chapter seven. So I then, you know, draw on a, a, a bunch of cases. So very briefly, I talk about uh, South Korea. I compare to South South Korea pre and post democratization, and I think pre democratized South Korea is actually very very similar to China today. Uh, uh, during you know before the Asian Games, the Seoul government actually sent in a bunch of gangsters to demolish slums in the city, and that went you know that went on without much resistance. But after after uh, democratization, the government tried to do the same thing. But by then, the the civil society was organized well enough to put together a, a housing move, movement to res to resist uh, state. Uh, uh, abusive uh, behavior, and I also com compare the uh, to the case of India, which is fascinating to me because the middle layer brokerage uh, uh, brokers are actually very powerful in India. So instead of a top-down relationship, these brokers they could actually dominate certain neighborhoods, such as you know slums or colonies in in India, and because they could de deliver vote bank. To local politicians, they have the support of slum dwellers. These local politicians, oftentimes, have to listen to the mafias and the gangsters who run the slums. So these brokers have way more power. They could even sometimes help the citizens to bargain for better public goods and services with the state. Again, very different uh, from China. I will talk about Russia, the use of violence during Yeltsin's years, and Putin. And, and and how they are actually different. Uh, concluding chapter, I talked about instances where outsourcing repression could actually be applied beyond urbanization in China. I'm happy to talk about that in Q and A. So when Xi Jinping first came to power in 2013, he launched a major campaign anti-corruption. But along with that campaign, there was also another campaign called Sweeping Block, Sao Hei Chua, which is to root out these collusion between gangsters mafias and uh, local government, collusive government. And he explicitly stated there are 12 targeted groups and one of them at the very bottom are people who work for the government and involved in, in housing demolition. And if you see how these gangsters then, then evolve, they may evolve to, be, to become powerful mafia, but their beginning right, usually started as some hired agents uh, for local governments that, that carry out uh, dirty jobs for the authorities. With that, I draw implications for China's political future and the future of field research in China as the political environment turned increasingly authoritarian in China, particularly with uh, just the passing of the 20th Congress last week uh, and zero COVID. Um, I consider myself very privileged to be able to spend so much time in China over nearly a decade to do uh, what I what I do. Um, and I think about how I want to, you know, when I advise my PhD uh, uh, students, I think about, you know, different strategies to gather data. Uh, very quickly, because of this audience in comparative perspectives, uh, I often get, get asked, why are there no slums in China? And I think my book helps to offer some partial answer to these uh, interesting and intriguing questions. There are actually slums in China, but they are, but but they're hidden because the state is able to mobilize citizens to, to, to live in a certain type of arrangement. So the slums are actually not visible. They are, they are not called slums, but they are no doubt, you know, uh, people of a lower uh, social status in, in the cities. Whereas, you know, one in six people uh, in Indian cities live in slums. This shows you how zero COVID is being implemented. And I think brokers, especially social brokers and political brokers play a major role in the ways in which zero COVID are implemented, are carried out in China. These are the people who take uh, community members, take their temperatures five times a day and administer tests every day. Uh, all sorts of people have been mobilized by the state and are willingly until a certain point to do the state's bidding. Whereas in Brazil, for instance, in Rio, two years ago, we heard about, you know, when the president did not give these carefree attitudes towards, uh, towards um, COVID, in the favelas, the gangsters, the mafia ring actually had to step in and enforce quarantine. 
So in a way, they are kind of the middle layers between society that play the role of a quasi-state uh, function. When when uh, state is absent in certain type of policy enforcement. So that gives you a contrast between the role of brokers in these two societies. So I will leave it here and I look forward to your question. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That is such an interesting topic. I think a lot of people don't really know anything about. I know that uh, before seeing your presentation for interacting with your work, I hadn't known very much about this, but I think it's so interesting. One of the uh, main questions or one of the sort of themes that a lot of the questions from the chat are coming up against are uh, how can this research like is that do you think that there would be any value or what kind of learnings do you think that we could get from a comparative approach to this kind of research to Toronto? I've seen a couple of people asking about the sort of accountability that you describe. What might that look like in the Canadian context? Uh, sort of what can we learn about Toronto? What can we learn about the situation in these cities from comparing them? Yeah, um, so uh, that is a great, great question. And I think at the end of the book, uh, chap chapter seven and eight, I tried to think about these important questions uh, by applying my arguments um, to a range of different type of cases. So. The important scope condition is the proxies that the government mobilize must be complicit in their act. And you we can imagine why these proxies are complicit. Number one, uh, the state can control their behavior. In China, most of the time, the state can actually control. So if you were to mobilize brokers to do things for you, you must be able to control them. And number two, these brokers buy into state's policies because of ideological reason. So there's a normative dimension to it. They, they believe in this, the, the concept of community. They believe in the Chinese Communist Party. They want to serve the Chinese Communist Party. They want to serve the, they see that as a way of serving the community, right? So if you compare it, you know, in a range of uh, development countries con context, uh, you could see that some of the, when scope conditions apply, such as in South, South Korea, um, uh, you could see similar outcome to to China, which is you know the brokers and and gangsters will help carry out the state bidding and be able to execute that outcome. But when the scope conditions uh, do not are not met, such as in India, such as in Brazil, because the brokers are very powerful, even more powerful than than the state in some instances. They can actually help to bargain on behalf of citizens. And then so that outcome is then becomes the opposite of what we see in China. Right. Um, yeah, I will I will I will leave it here because I need to think about to what extent brokers actually play, play a role in democratic societies such as uh, such as Canada. Um, I think the context is actually very different. And I think this middle layer um, we, I have to think through to what extent that, that actually exists and how much power they actually do possess uh, in a democratic society. Yeah, advanced democratic society. That's super interesting. Um, I, yeah, I think there's definitely a lot to learn there. Another question that Ben asked that I thought was also really interesting that I was wondering about as well is in sort of a more tight knit community or in a smaller community. Uh, do you think that citizens sort of see the collusions between these actors that you describe, uh, like people's aunties and uncles and the state? Um, do you think that this is just sort of understood and accepted by the community? And then how do these kinds of actors for the state hold on to credibility in their communities if this kind of collusion with the state is obvious? Right. Um, so these aunties and uncles, um, when they do mediation, uh, they are it's usually out of ideological conviction, right? But they have to do, if they have to do more difficult job of convincing people to sign consent papers when there's pressure for them to do so. So I, one of my case studies, I looked at how the state actually first gives some carrots, some early bird bonuses to these brokers and uh, get them to sign papers. 
and and then give them the incentive to convince other people because they have got social capital, they command some legitimacy in the communities. And per family, one family that they convince, uh, they get extra bonuses. So these people are driven by ideology and, and on some occasions they are also driven by, by positive uh, incentives. At the end, you, so people in the community may end up consenting, but, but the consent, uh, shows up as consent on papers but behind the scenes uh it could be in it could be it could be chorus con consent it could be a relationship that that is being torn apart fabric of society being torn apart and very very difficult to to mend uh because you force me to do something even though i will comply will comply uh you i do it out of coercion Right, so there is a lot of uh, strained relationship in neighborhoods that that have undergone uh, demolition. Yeah, just a follow up of my own on that point. How do you see the long term effects of these kinds of strained relationships playing out in communities? How do you think that potentially in like five or ten years the fabrics of these communities might be affected, and what effects do you think this might have on sort of the greater process that's going on? Right. So, so I've been to quite a lot of these communities and interestingly, the divorce rates are usually very high. And the, and the divorce rates are high for two reasons. Some people do use it as a trick to bargain for more compensation because as individuals, you might actually get more than being a couple. So they will get a divorce to, bar to get more compensation and then remarry to the same person again. Right. But it also happens because there's genuine strain in the relationship. Uh, you know, husband and wife may actually quarrel and not talk, not talk to each other, and end up getting a uh, divorce because millions of 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 uh, money, a lot of money is at stake. Uh, uh, um, I think I think the state by manufacturing conflicts in the society because they want to get certain things done, they send people in either to convince them or sometimes even to 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 manipulate human relationship uh, they are actually in my view tearing the fabric of of society apart and i'm and i'm not an anthropologist i'm not a humanities person and i don't study human relationship uh, but i could imagine that um, um, the tension in chinese society particularly urban societies have to be very high uh, when they have uh, this sort of uh, state state project being being carried out Definitely. That's really, really, yeah, the statistics about the divorce rate are really, really interesting. I never would have guessed that, but I feel like that makes complete sense the way you explained it. Uh, just to sort of switch topics, we had another question about the roles of different levels of government. So how do you see uh, the different levels of government all the way from city up to uh, ultimately the state being involved in this process? How do you think that they collaborate or just sort of like what kind of hand all of these different levels have in the process? Sure. So, um, so the central government typically in China is, it is a unitary state, right? But it's actually a very decentralized state where lo uh, local governments, they are responsible for 70% of government expenditures, but they have about 30 to 35% of revenue, right? So they have a lot of un unfunded mandates unfunded mandates that they don't have revenue to carry out, that they don't have the legitimacy to carry out because they don't provide, they cannot provide public goods uh, to the same set of uh, community. So we see that in the accumulation of local government debt, we see that in, you know, how urbanization projects are being carried out. Uh, 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 when you are tasked to do something, but you, you lack the legitimacy and the legitimate means to do that, you think about convenient solution. You think about hiring people, just go intimidate them in the middle of, of the night. No one noticed that no one would actually know on, on an average basis. And you know, you get them to do what you want. And if that is done regularly enough, uh, sometimes you get the local government into trouble. But if but the the thing with, with political uh, system in China is that people get promoted or not rotated every couple of months. Oh, no, sorry, every couple of years, every three years they get ro they get rotated. So you carry out a project, you get political achievement, and you get recognition. 
you get promoted or rotated elsewhere, someone else come in and clean up your mess. Too bad. Yeah, unfortunately, we only have time for one last question. Uh, this is just sort of a question about how you use terms in your own research. Uh, Bruno is interested in how you define the idea of capacity for violence. So whether this relates to the sheer number of people that violence is being enacted against or sort of like the level of harm that's being done to individuals. Sure, and I see that, you know, Karen also has a related question about about, about comparative uh, research and and uh, brokers being a sign of high functioning uh, society. So I think, you know, there are, there, are, there, are, there are several things to say about that. Um, uh, re really defining on, really depend on how you could then define high functioning. But I think these brokers uh, uh, work for positive incentives. Sometimes they have to be coerced to do certain things, even, uh, even though I think that is less likely in the context of China. And I think it works very well in China, usually for no, for normative reason. And sometimes they've also given carrots uh, to do the state bidding. Amazing. Okay, well, I think that unfortunately we are going to have to wrap it up now. Uh, thank you so much to everyone who came to listen. Thank you so much, Lynette, for bringing your amazing knowledge uh, to this conversation. So we would just like to invite everyone uh, in the chat to our next session, which is going to feature a discussion with Amy Bilton titled Community Adoption of Eco-Technology and Grassroots Approach to Climate Change. So this session will take place on Wednesday, November 16th at uh, noon Eastern time. So just the same as now. Uh, and to register, you can just visit our website. So thank you so much, everybody. Uh, we are going to have to bring the session to a close, but it's been fantastic. Uh, just a big thanks again to Lynette. Thank you again day, for hosting me. And thank you everyone for coming.